All right, we're going to get going um, because it's the end of the day and we have a lot um, to cover, a lot of good material to cover with this excellent panel. Um, first, I want to just remind you all of the objectives for this session um, as, as we've sort of thought about what we wanted to accomplish today. First, we want to provide you with a, a more informed perspective, uh, really on the realities of the funding environment um, currently for devices. Um, we want to increase your understanding of ways to more effectively navigate the fundraising process. And finally, uh, this panel is, is really quite generous in, in how they, what they share and, and just the degree to which they're really uh, willing to share their experiences. Um, so they're going to share some of their lessons learned over time uh, about the fundraising process to better position you um, and your company for success. Um, as we get started, I wanted to just take a quick pulse of the audience, and if you have started a company, can you raise your hand? Okay, lots. Um, how many of you are currently funding, you've pitched to an investor? Okay. How many have already raised some money for your startup? Good. And then, do any of you just plan to begin fundraising in the next three to six months? All right. Great. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to just um, take a couple minutes. You, you know, Alan uh, May did a great job of, of presenting some, um, printing the, the sort of landscape for medical device fundraising. Um, and one of the things we're going to do is, you know, just as a reminder, we have, uh, in terms of the seed round of investments, excuse me. Um, you know, the, the early seed and early stage deals are down from 114 to 76 deals uh, now and just that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we have some interesting data. Um, again, this is still really early, doesn't, uh, is not fully representative of the sector. Seems sort of at surface to be encouraging for devices. Um, however, we see that investment in life science, in the, the broad life science sector is, has decreased significantly by 22%. Um, and while VC investment uh, in medical technology is up, uh, Series A investments are still down with only 11 deals in the first quarter of 2012, as Alan mentioned, which is, which is quite um, striking. The other thing I wanted to do is, is um, just take a moment to, to look at the uh, mergers and acquisitions activity. This data was presented yesterday. Uh, by J.P. Morgan at the Wilson Sonsini Medical Device Conference. Um, far left, that's 1997, moving forward to 2012 so far. Um, you know, uh, this just so gives you a flavor of the trends in the activity. The blue are the mergers and acquisitions. Um, we see that m and peaked in 2005 at 37 in MedTech, um, and we're down to 20 in 2011. Uh, but there's, you know, this is sort of a, perhaps a good news, bad news, or at least, um, you know, something to watch uh, in terms of the strategic investors. Um, you know, while growth uh, is stagnating, um, the cash reserves of the strategics are, are building, uh, representative now of uh, perhaps more than $50 billion. However, um, I think the far right column is interesting because it's important to note that more than half of these strategics have had uh, changes in their senior management, and what that signals to us is just that it will take longer uh, to make decisions, to make buy decisions, particularly for if you're a, a startup looking to be uh, bought by one of these strategics. And then we talked a little bit, and we'll, we'll circle back to this at the, at the end of our discussion about these other models and, and how those might um, be opportunities for you. Um, the format for this panel is first we're going to actually have um, the entrepreneurs and even our, the uh, investor on our panel um, pitch to you. So uh, it really is a way to introduce you to the audience. Um, so first, I'm going to start with um, Sam Mazin and Akshay Nanduri. Um, uh, Sam is uh, president of Reflection Medical. He has his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, bachelor's in computer engineering, 
from the University of Waterloo. He's the inventor of the company's core technology, and he was also a Kaufman Entrepreneur Postdoc Fellow. Um, his uh, co-founder, Akshay Nanduri, is VP BizDev for Reflection Medical, um, brings strong um, startup background in product management, technology commercialization, and software engineering, employee number one at a company uh, that was sold, actually, to uh, Research in Motion. Um, uh, MBA from MIT's Sloan program and uh, computer engineering master's and uh, bachelor's degrees from University of Waterloo, presumably where uh, they met. And then what I'll do is as we go through these pitches, I'll come back and I'll introduce each founder or each uh, panelist uh, before they give their pitch because that'll help uh, with the story. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Um, it's an honor to be uh, pitching to you guys today. Uh, somewhat, I don't know, more intimidating when you're pitching to founders. Um, and, and I don't know why that is, but, uh, so I'll be doing the pitch. Akshay's gonna talk about our funding story. Um, but uh, we actually met in high school, so we're you know, even older friends, and you know, according to the recent presentation, I guess we're doomed, right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, so yeah, let me just take you quickly through Reflection Medical. Um, and, and, and what, what we're really doing. So this is a patient with early stage cancer. Uh, you see the tumor, this is a PET scan of that patient. Um, when you detect cancer in early stage, it's localized. And so you can use localized treatments, which are usually very effective, like surgery or radiosurgery, which is really just high dose, very precise radiation therapy in ablative form of, of treatment, um, to essentially kill or, or extract that tumor and results in relatively uh, good cure rates, and that's why it's important to detect cancer as early as possible. Unfortunately, for every patient that you detect at an early stage, you have about two that's detected at a later stage. So most people who are, who are detected with cancer look like this, and their, their disease is already spread, and so these effective localized treatments are not really options anymore for uh, this type of patient. Um, surgery is too cumbersome on this patient and most likely won't be successful. And radio surgery is actually too complex uh, to handle so many sites. Um, so, it, however, and so these patients will be on some sort of maybe biologic or chemotherapy and usually not have a very good prognosis, unfortunately. Um, the biologic therapy is, is good in the sense that it's, it's a targeted systemic therapy that uh, will try to differentiate between cancerous and non-cancerous tissue, but it, you, you don't really have the advantage of, of being able to kill the gross disease that still exists. And that's where those types of, of treatments suffer. What if we could combine those two? What if we could take advantage of localized therapy and make it biologically targeted? And that's essentially what we're doing, um, developing a, a treatment that is targeted, um, tumoricidal, non-invasive, cost-effective, and even convenient. And, and the that way sounds we, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, then stay tuned. Um, so, uh, you, and, and what if I also told you that, uh, I guess I'm really pitching here, that uh, uh, we are, uh, that we can do this with technology that actually already exists today. So we're taking advantage of really the, the revolution that happened in the imaging world, which uh, was really biological imaging. Everything went from anatomic guidance, as you see here with these uh, CT scans and MRI, really in image anatomy well. But uh, the, the revolution in PET, positron emission tomography, enabled biological imaging, and that's why PET is now the gold standard for detecting cancer non-invasively in the body. What if we were to pair this biological targeting with one of the most effective, uh, effective localized treatments, radiosurgery? Essentially, we could have um, our biologically targeted radiosurgery to be able to use um, this paired device, which I'll show you what it'll look like, to treat patients at a later stage, to enable radiosurgery for those patients with multiple disease sites in their body. And so this is really uh, what, what we're trying to do. Why is radiosurgery so difficult to do right now? It's really a problem of motion. When people are, are sitting there on the patient table and, and uh, being treated with radiation, they're not static objects. They're breathing, they're moving. You have this moving target problem, and with radio surgery, you have to be very precise about where you're delivering. Otherwise, it's not safe. So how do we 
use PET to essentially solve this problem. And, and the, the technical, technological innovation we overcame to be able to combine PET and radiosurgery just comes from and is explained in this slide. This is a, a PET scanner. And in PET, the way PET works is a patient is injected with, with a radio marker, um, um, some type of tag, that distributes throughout, throughout the body and uh, concentrates in areas of cancer. And those cancer areas become signal emitters. They're sending out photons of information. That's how you make a PET image of where tumors are in the body. The problem with PET is that it takes minutes to generate an image. And if you have to wait minutes, you can't really use it for real-time tracking and guidance of radiosurgery. The way um, we get around this problem is that instead of waiting for uh, those many minutes for the, the image to be acquired, every time you actually get one of those photons, you have line of sight to the target. What if we can send radiation back along those emission paths as we detect them? So that's really the concept of, of how we can use PET in a real-time way, really having the tumors themselves light up for us during treatment so we can target them automatically. Uh, our system concept looks like this where we are really combining just a PET scanner with uh, a radiation therapy system that already exists, um, putting them together into a single device that will be able to uh, home in on the PET signal from tumors in the body. And so that it's really a simple concept. Um, uh, we, we, our latest results, which we'll be presenting at a conference uh, this, this uh, summer at the Medical Physics Conference, um, with our first patient feasibility study, demonstrates that from a, from a clinical scenario where you're getting PET data from, in this case, a lung cancer patient, um, where radiation would have gone in this patient had they been treated with our system. So we have, we have essentially a proof of feasibility of this concept, and now we're at the point where we're raising Series A capital to build the first prototype system. And so, you know, it's, it's actually an attractive market. Uh, it's a market that has grown uh, pretty rapidly in the last decade. It's over tripled in growth. Um, you know, as I said, there's, there's really no miracles required in, in building the system. It takes advantage of two technologies that already exist today. The regulatory path is also fairly straightforward. All external beam radiotherapy companies have been 510K paths, uh, not PMA. And we can leverage reimbursement codes that already exist. So there's even a straightforward uh, reimbursement story. Um, and that's the, the size of the A round we're raising. And, and we have a fantastic team of people that are helping us out. And, and I'm blessed to be with, with my co-founder, Akshay, who's going to talk about our funding story uh, soon. But um, that's Reflection Medical. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So next, I'm going to um, introduce Avi Roop, who's CEO of Moret Surgical. Avi has 16 years uh, experience in medical devices, uh, has been involved in uh, commercializing seven device products, um, a very active inventor, um, uh, many uh, issued and, pat and pending patent applications. Um, Avi has 12 years in the device industry uh, at companies such as St. Jude, Boston Scientific, and uh, Vascular Science. Uh, he was a Cottrell Fellow in the Stanford Biodesign Program. He was also um, in a very special program uh, for the Kauffman Foundation focused on pediatric uh, medical device innovation. Um, uh, academically, um, he's currently an MBA ca candidate at Berkeley's Haas Business School um, with a mechanical engineering uh, degree from University of Minnesota. So, Avi, you want to tell us about Moret? Sorry. Great. Thank you, Sandy. So Mirat Surgical is a minimally invasive, next generation minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery. It came out of the St Stanford Biodesign Program. It's half funded by non-dilutive money and by uh, angel investment that currently is in the form of convertible debt. We incorporated in 2010. The team is a combination of engineers, um, postdocs, and a surgeon. And currently we're advised by minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery at Stanford and Northwestern. So, what are we working on? It's about minimizing visible scar. Who cares? Well, patients actually care. There's a continued driving force to make standard surgical procedures more elegant, involve less pain, involve less scarring, and consume fewer resources. What's been happening to date, there's been surgery like natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery, uh, transoral uh, gallbladder removal, single port surgery, which uh, Alan May was involved with, uh, trans umbilical surgery. Uh, people also use pediatric surgical tools. All of these um, approaches drive com uh, compromises that surgeons are unwilling to, to make. Uh, either the procedures are too slow, 
they're too costly, too costly, or the safety profile isn't like what they're used to. Uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, so gallbladder removal is done a million times a year. It's the bread and butter procedure of every general surgeon. Uh, they do it in 25 minutes. They don't want to waste extra time or extra money. All of these other procedures drive compromises that make it unpalatable. The next wave is percutaneous assemblable surgical, uh, excuse me, surgical tools, and that's what we're working on. So why? Why does this stick with the market? Let's look at the stakeholders. What do patients care about? They care about a scar-free result, but they're not interested in giving up safety. Um, other methods of percutaneous surgery, no scar surgery, drive higher rates of, of complications. The surgeons, they care about speed. Uh, they're used to doing things very quickly, and they're not interested in doubling the procedure time. Uh, in addition, they don't want to substitute something that is uh, very comfortable to them. So we have to provide them surgical tools that are very familiar and a process to complete the surgery, which is very familiar. And then the facilities uh, are making profit on things like gallbladder, gallbladder removal. However, it's very thin. In, in, in including or introducing uh, fancy gizmos, better mouse traps that drive up the uh, burden on the facilities is not going to work. Most of these procedures are done in outpatient settings, oftentimes co-owned by the physicians that do the procedure. What are we offering? The, sap, the safest, the fastest, and most cost-effective way to do this. What we do is we assemble a pediatric surgical tool to a standard five millimeter shaft. What we've invented is the only mechanism that preserves all of the tool feel that surgeons are used to. Every other system that uh, has been come before us drives some compromise in terms of that efficiency. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. So next, I, I want to introduce um, Amr Salahe. Amr is founder and CEO of a company called Maya Medical, uh, which spun out of Shifa Med, uh, an incubator that Amr also founded. Maya, Medi Maya Medical was recently acquired by a Covidian. Um, Amr founded Sadra Medical, which sold to Boston Scientific for $450 million in, uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, formerly, he was uh, vice president in, of R&D at Boston Scientific. Uh, he has extensive management experience via, via his engineering consulting firm, uh, Sobeck Medical, he where he worked with key clients such as EPI, cardiothoracic systems, and Guidant. Uh, Amr is on the board of several medical device companies. He is a highly prolific inventor with more than 100 patents to his name. He has degrees in biomedical and electrical engineering from Case Western Reserve University. And Amr is going to tell us a little bit about Maya. Thank you. Go ahead and start the... Uh... Are you going to go to the roadmap? No, well, we're going to go do the pitch, right? Yeah, just the pitch, so... You're going to through the slide, you're going to push the slides there? Yeah, I don't have, I didn't have the pitch slides, I just had the roadmap slide. Oh, sorry, same thing. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll just describe what we're yeah. doing. So we, um, we actually were, we had started a company called uh, Apom Medical. It was an AFib ablation catheter that we've been working on. We had uh, raised money through angels and things were going okay, uh, making good progress. Uh, we actually managed to get money from the National Science Foundation and sort of in the middle of the process of raising money and talking to people, we became aware of what RDN was doing. RDN is a renal innovation company uh, that sort of broke new grounds in terms of a treat new treatment uh, using a catheter to ablate nerves, um, renal artery nerves that really can allow communication between the brain and the kidney. And we looked at their technology and realized, geez, our, our technology could do this better, faster. So we said, let's just make a change here. We quickly jumped on uh, filing new patents and so forth, uh, essentially put on hold the first project we work on because the new opportunity was easier technology to develop, a much bigger market, and a much bigger appetite from uh, potential partners, potential acquirers. And we shifted the team. Uh, we've been working in the house. I mean, that's, that's something that we've been doing for a while. Um, so the few of us, or just three or four of us, uh, started working on uh, Maya Medical, and uh, because we already had a, a system and a process and a network of people we're working on, we're able to very quickly get into prototypes, get into animals, uh, and start raising money. Um, and raised money, uh, developed the product. The product was essentially uh, what, what uh, is a turning a 
point-by-point -point ablation procedure into a single ablation. Uh, so what Ardian does, they have a, a, single, a, a catheter that has an electrode on the tip of it, and they have to create a circular pattern, a helical pattern uh, in the artery uh, to ablate the nerve. Uh, so it's a tedious procedure and it requires you know, quite a bit of manipulation on the part of the physician and certainly not terribly repeatable, at least doesn't seem like it is, or didn't seem like it was for us. So what we were developing was a, uh, a, a catheter that has uh, electrodes painted on a balloon, essentially. And uh, so what we did is we designed a balloon that has the circular pattern on it. Um, and it's an irrigated system. Uh, so we quickly developed that uh, and uh, got into animals, demonstrated it, um, got into humans, got CE Mark, and in, in the late stage of the process, sold the company. So that's, that's the story. Great. Thank you. So Amr has a really interesting model um, that he's going to expand upon more. After we do these introductions, we're, we're going to go through and look at the funding roadmaps for each of these companies and um, get a better sense of what it what it has taken to, to get to this point. Um, any panel on medical device fundraising would not be complete without an investor. We have Mike Kaplan here who's going to um, uh, wear a few hats on the panel, uh, mainly as agitator and, uh, and as, you know, uh, Sand Hill Road sort of type uh, traditional venture firm and then talk about a new model that he's developed. So he's going to be playing different roles and just, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> Which is fine, because I'm generally schizophrenic anyway. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> so one of the important things in fundraising is to know your audience. Um, you are the audience, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that it's about 20 after 4 on a Friday afternoon, and you've been here all day. Um, so everybody at this point, please assume that the folksy story I was going to tell you now that had a really funny ending that you've just heard it and we're going to move on and kind of cover quickly what Altos Health is and why. <laughs> um, so, you know, you heard the gloom and doom from Alan a little while ago and you can draw the parallel to, you know, the forest fire, right? Big forest fire came through the industry in 2007, 2008, started to burn up a lot of the venture capital fund trees. Um, but the nice thing about the uh, forest fire is it leads to rebirth and hopefully rebirth in a positive direction. Um, I kind of looked at that point in time and realized that with, uh, with the changes that were taking place, it became obvious that the venture capital industry had done a wonderful job of proving it doesn't scale well um, and proving that the existing model just didn't work in an environment that uh, we were moving into. And, and beyond that, you know, we did a lot of damage to ourselves in terms of the way we were working with portfolio companies and we had evolved from being mostly a group of people who like to build companies to being mostly a group of people who like to sit on boards and manage portfolios. And that's not fun, at least it's not fun for me. So I started Altos Health really as an alternative to how to do that. And as any good entrepreneur, I sort of thought, is the market ready for this model or not? Do I have to prove something yet? Realized I had to prove something, so I just built it myself and funded it myself, the operating and investment capital for the first few years. You know, I, I, everybody's got marketing slides and pitches, and, and Sandy asked me to do this, and then she asked me to do it in three minutes. So I, I kind of put one slide together to talk about how I think what I'm trying to do with Altos Health is different than the traditional venture model. Um, the traditional venture model is really designed to screen out almost everything, to really focus on eliminating deals because of risk, and to build a portfolio on the hope that you can manage the portfolio and drive toward putting lots of money into the big winners and kind of ignore and, and weed out the, the losers. Apparently they are puppies, I did not realize that, um, <laughs> along the way. Um, and by the way, you know, the unspoken truth of the industry is that venture people generally make pretty nice incomes whether they invest successfully or not, which is perhaps a disincentive and a, and a pretty bad malalignment of interest that if anybody wants to over a beer, we can talk about in more detail. The idea for Altos Health is basically, you know, approach it like rugby, which is you kind of got to get in the scrum to figure out what's going on and then try and make it happen. Uh, and so for me, I'm only going to work with at most three or four companies at a time. I'm going to spend a lot of time with them to give you a context of that. You know, three active companies right now. Uh, one of them, I'm the chairman of the board. One of them, I'm acting as interim CEO. And the third, I'm leading the strategy process for the company, right? So this is sort of on-site intensive. Um, you know, really work with the entrepreneurs to try and make it happen. 
And from my perspective, the fact that the industry has flown away from early stage investing makes it a tremendous opportunity, right? The appetite of the strategics is not going away. The need for innovation in healthcare is not going away. There are probably some things we have to do differently about thinking of reimbursement and value propositions and working with the FDA as those all evolve. But the environment is actually quite wonderful because if you can get funding for your early stage medical device company, um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. There will be such a small inventory of Series B type medical device companies in two, three, four years that you will be in the catbird seat. Um, whether that's for additional venture funding, once you've de-risked the company and proven some things, whether that's to get strategic funding, whether that's to get an early exit, any and all of the above, you know, the reality is if you can get the funding, there has never been a better time to innovate within medical devices. So one of the things I want to um, just to give some a little bit more background about Mike, given, particularly given the uh, the role he's going to play on the panel, is that um, you know as I uh, talked was talking to a lot of VCs when things were getting um, really sort of unpleasant in late 2008 and 2009, uh, Mike was pretty unusual in a, a large, a fairly large peer group here, um, in that you know he wasn't sort of running around saying the sky is falling. He said you know, and what do I do, and waving his hands, he, he came up with this model, and, and I just want to give you a little bit of flavor for um, uh, his activity at Three Arch Partners, his former firm, um, which managed over a billion dollars, over five funds, and Mike was on, uh, led the investment or served on the boards um, for 18 of the firm's portfolio companies, which is quite active. Um, those companies, by the way, have realized um, exit values of more than uh, well over a billion dollars to date. Um, and Mike uh, also, you know, long commitment to healthcare. He held uh, senior executive roles with Blue Shield in California, uh, formerly uh, Stanford uh, GSB MBA and bachelor's with high honor honors in um, from WashU in St. Louis. Um, he's also a really active volunteer um, uh, with many uh, organizations in his community, which is very cool. Um, so now we're going to switch to having each of these entrepreneurs tell you a little bit about their story their, and they're going to show you, um, you know, the path that they've taken for their funding. Um, let me give this to Akshay. So first we're going to start with Reflection Medical. Sure. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so I'm going to get into how we got to where we are right now and get into the nuts and bolts of the funding that we raised. So first, oops. Oh, got it. Yeah, so first I'm going to start with a, a nice visual timeline. So um, Sam came up with the idea in uh, late 2007, so er, like around early 2008. Uh, we filed for a provisional, or Sam filed for a provisional shortly after that. Um, then Sam got selected to an SIE program at Stanford, which is a great entrepreneurship program there. Um, we incorporated on St. Patty's Day, uh, so every year we celebrate a lot. Um, and uh, that's that a great business strategy. Yeah, it was uh, you know it's intended. Um, we entered the MIT Business Plan Competition. We're semifinalists uh, in 2000, uh, 2009. Then our our fairy godmother, the Kaufman Foundation, uh, Sam was selected uh, as a Kaufman Labs postdoc fellow. Um, we also entered the Stanford Basis Competition at this time. Um, no money in the company so far, uh, although the Kaufman Foundation funded Sam's postdoc, uh, and he was on this company uh, on reflection 100% of the time. Um, we negotiated uh, an important uh, IP license from UChicago uh, that was a freedom to operate issue. Um, and we got our first results through, through software simulations at this point. Still no money into the company. Sam's 100% uh, of his time on this, myself as well. Um, and I just graduated from business school. Um, so we raised a seed round uh, in late 2010 and uh, early 2011. I'm going to tell you exactly how we did that and uh, you know, the strategy behind that. Office space, uh, Jay Watkins on our board. Um, issued patent, uh, more results, um, a phase one SBIR from the NCI came in, um, our first patient study, um, and we'll be giving our first talk at the big medical physics conference uh, this summer. 
And we're also poised to raise Series A capital uh, very shortly. So if there's any VCs in the room, you know, take note of that. Mike. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the motivation for uh, the seed round was really we needed, we needed capital. We really wanted to uh, get cash for food and shelter, um, which is important. Um, our IP lawyers are very expensive, uh, so we needed to, uh, you know, pay them. Um, and we also wanted results to de-risk the project. And, and de-risking is, is like a key theme here. Um, and also provided, I guess, um, the basis for... Um, our strategy on the seed round. Um, you saw Sam present the idea, like this is a big idea, it's like a big metal project, lots of components spinning around the patient, like it looks complicated. Uh, the first time, this is a funny story, the first time we presented um, the concept to Jay Watkins, we showed a picture of what the system looks like and we were like practice pitching to him and, and Jay said, don't ever show that picture again. It looks like you're going to launch this thing into space. Um, so we really, we really wanted to signal to the venture community that this is a big idea, that we're disrupting cancer treatment, that there's market acceptance for this, and you know, there's, there's some clinical potential. So what if we could raise the seed round exclusively from industry execs and entrepreneurs, our advisors and mentors, actual clinicians to get docs to put in money, and also cancer centers. And that was, that was our strategy. And so I'm gonna tell you how we went about doing that. So if you look at the funnel of, of like these people that we wanted to get to, um, first of all, these business plan competitions are, are just a fantastic uh, venue and platform to call basically anybody anywhere in the US or potentially around the world. So you, know, you should use uh, these uh, you know, these programs to your advantage. Um, we, I'd say we did about 30 to, 30 to 40 clinician interviews during uh, these business plan competitions. And then when you want to get to industry execs, uh, this, this is just frankly what we did. We read industry press releases. We found out who the executives were, uh, board members of these companies. We looked at the biggest exits in our space, looked at the SEC filings to see who owned these companies, who had money. Right? So we wanted to go after the folks that actually made money in, in radiation therapy. We used LinkedIn to get to these people. And then this is an, in, an interesting one. We also befriended a couple of industry salespeople uh, who sold radiation therapy equipment. They had a network of doctors. And we just said, look, we'll, we'll give you 10% of, uh, you know, as a commission. If we close any of these guys, we'll, we'll give you 10%. So that's how we, we kind of wanted to get to these clinicians as well as uh, these industry execs. And then results really helped. Uh, we went to conferences. Um, we used tools like uh, Slide Rocket and, and you know, telephone to, uh, to get in front of these guys, all, all just kind of virtually, um, and then eventually signed some, some folks. And key takeaways were uh, data and results really uh, were critical for clinicians. Also, Clinicians um, generally don't make, a lot of them don't make seed investments, so they're not really familiar with convertible debt. So what, the way we position it is, um, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see it. So we position it as you're getting a better deal than the venture capitalist. So you know, the, 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 the capital you put in will convert at the Series A price, and you're kind of protecting their investment. This is a classic sales technique, just using scarcity, and I think if you, raise this kind of exclusive round, uh, it plays nicely into, into this technique where you're only raising money from you know, former industry execs and, and high quality radiation oncologists. Um, and we also turned down money from uh, like a, an accounting firm that wanted to put in money and, and just generally investors that seem to be uh, a little bit troublesome. So how do we actually do? Um, in, in reality, this, this kind of strategic seed round was, uh, was very long and, and brutal, and it took a lot of discipline to stick to our guns. So we had a couple of uh, commitments, verbal commitments, uh, from uh, one of my professors and, and a SAB member. Um, you can see it goes on for a while. Another couple commitments, no cash in, in the uh, bank account yet, and then finally, we got to our first close, so we actually had money uh, in the bank account, and very shortly after, uh, got to the final close. And of course, we were oversubscribed, as every round should be. Um, and what helped, uh, 
you know, around that time, we brought in the salespeople, so that helped us expand into doctors. You know, the results started coming out, and the conferences were right leading up into the first close. So you can see just the timing on this. Um, it took a while, and I guess the real question is, uh, you know, is this worth doing? And I would say, for our particular case, uh, we feel it was the right call. I think maybe some of these techniques I've described, you know, you can use yourself, but it may not be the right. Uh, you know, the right path for your business. For us, you know, we ended up getting a former senior VP and 40-year veteran at, at, at the number one uh, radiation therapy player, Varian Medical Systems, co-founder of one of the largest acquisitions in our space. We had a freestanding cancer center put money into us and, and a bunch of radiation oncologists and an imaging entrepreneur. Um, it was also a major factor in getting SBIR funding as well. We had actually been rejected twice by the, uh, by the NCI for the same grant application. And then when we came back to them and said, look at all these other great folks that have put money into us, um, don't you wanna get on this train before it go, you know, goes quickly to Series A financing? And you know, we were able to get the SBIR. So for us, definitely it was the right call. Great, I think as we, um, as we start, one of the things I'd like to ask Mike um, before before he comments on reflection, is just to, Mike, any comments you heard Alan May's talk and, you know, just on the, the medical device funding landscape, what's, what's sort of your real take? How do you think about this, you know, in, in the average week lately? Yeah, so, so the reality is you can count on one hand the number of venture capital firms that are really investing in seed and early stage um, medical device companies, right? So that's, you know, I, I'll be straight with you. It's a very, very difficult environment, probably the toughest ever. Um, the, the alternatives that are popping up are interesting. It's still a little early to understand. Seems like there's a new incubator every week. Um, and to the degree that that can help you pull your team together and make some progress, that's great. Um, time will tell whether those have, have been helpful. There are active angel communities. There are strategic investors, et cetera. I, I think the most important thing to take away from the history of reflection is these guys did their homework. You know, you should, uh, you know, the, the research that you need to do before you go and sit down with someone um, is astounding. It, it's not that difficult to get meetings with venture people because you, know, you can generally find your way to get a warm introduction. And for the most part, when you get a warm introduction, you get a meeting because everybody wants to maintain their networks and, and, and be thoughtful in that regard. But if you walk into a conversation and you haven't done their homework to know, you know, have they made other investments in this arena? Have they worked in the industry in the past? Do they have a bias one way or the other? Can you demonstrate a relationship between their investing style and, and what your company's trying to accomplish? I mean, if you can't tick off things like that going into the meeting and having done your competitive intelligence, then you know, you're gonna have a really challenging time. So I, I, I love the way the Reflection team approached this as, you know, a tactical effort to figure out who the right targets were and then, you know, use sh shoe leather and energy and time to get that done. I'm not sure I'd recommend finding sales reps to go out and offer them commissions on finding angel investors from the physician community for a bunch of reasons, but our, it works. Our lawyer, uh, our lawyer advised against that. Yeah. Um, there, there are these things called securities laws, and <laughs> it's terrible, really. Did you get many of those guys? Uh, I think uh, maybe it's two. Yeah, just two. Yeah, yeah. two out of three. But it came at a crucial time, though. Yeah. Great. Mike, one question about this um, compared to the other technologies we're hearing about. Um, this is capital equipment. So as an investor, do you think differently about capital equipment versus uh, maybe a more typical device? You know, so I do, but it kind of is a function of matching the investor to the project. Um, you know, if you're going and, and, and you're going to pursue a project that's capital equipment, which generally, not always, but generally means that it's going to be a, a more expensive development path than, say, a disposable 510K type of a product. Not always, but generally. You know, you, you probably don't want to go after investors who have a bias toward extreme capital efficiency. You probably want to go after folks who have uh, deeper pockets who can support a more cost-intensive development plan. So again, it's a matter of doing your homework to figure out where are the most likely people to call on and talk to, you know, rather than anything else. There are folks who, 
you know, have large funds and, and really want to utilize capital in those large funds and are really biased towards shooting for big new market opportunities. And those might be a perfectly good match. Great. Um, Sam and Akshay, what can you describe for the audience sort of how your approach to speaking with investors um, and sort of your strategy um, in maybe first meetings, um, getting that first meeting? How, how has your approach to um, the whole investor activity, the fundraising activity evolved over time? You can go for it. Uh, it's a good question, and and uh, and to Mike's point, you know this we're, we're this is a big capital intensive, uh, or we're developing capital equipment. So you know a lot of people kind of get get scared by that idea. Um, we so we're raising you know 11 million dollar round early stage med tech. It's it's a big round to be raising right now. We realize that that there are you know not many firms out there that that you know do that, um, and so our strategy has has kind of shifted to. Um, looking at you know where where is some of the money nowadays that you know can in, you know invest or co-invest in these types of companies and and, th and that shifted us to kind of the corporates and so we've been uh, so in the early days we were we were really targeting VCs and in our, our initial meetings um, we weren't as selective because um, we didn't really know who uh, you know which groups actually um, you know had money. Uh, you know, it, it's it's something that uh, it's a delicate thing to even find out. Um, you know, some groups might just spin your wheels a bit. Um, so, so we became much more smart about how we selected which groups to, to even go after, regardless of their philosophy, just what state they are in their fund, when did they raise their, their most recent fund. For us, you know, ones that have recently raised a fund um, would be, you know, more attractive for us. Um, and, and, and that shift to the corporate uh, world where where we went after venture capital groups of corporate arms, um, so that uh, we could get you know get some interest from that community and use that to build interest from from the the pure VC community. Uh, actually, give no. That's great. So now I'm going to ask uh, Avi to talk about his funding pathway Oops. with Moret. Thanks. I guess I don't need that. Okay. Just the one slide here. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I broke it down into. Uh, some buckets, but the, the basic point is that there's half, half non-dilutive, half dilutive. Dilutive is angel funding, it's a convertible debt, it has a coupon, has a change of control payment associated with it. Uh, what that's allowed us to do is maintain a high level of equity for everybody on the team. The insight here is something that came out of some of the work that I was able to do with the Kauffman Foundation and my time in a big company. And the basic insight is that you don't, I, I don't believe you need to work on a medical device specifically, for example, surgical tool innovation in necessarily uh, an 80 hour a week format or a 60 hour a week format. I believe you can work on it in kind of a 20 to 30 hour a week format for the team and you can make progress that isn't, um, and you can have a burn rate that is effectively an order of magnitude below what a standard small ball venture capital firm would, a uh, small ball venture capital backed company uh, would, would go through. So, and, and I'd argue that then the speed is not an order of magnitude slower. Maybe it's half, maybe it's 60%. So there's a little bit of an arbitrage uh, that's happening there. So how do, we, how do we do this? We have to cover our salary, we have to develop the product, uh, we have to do testing for the design, and we have to generate IP. Um, intellectual property has been the bulk of our angel money requirements. Uh, as the non-dilutive funding, we have typically, as you know, probably has lots of restrictions, not able to spend it on patent uh, generation. On the salary side, we were able to start off with um, fellowship salary uh, that was part of the Biodesign program and the Kauffman Foundation. And then, uh, in addition to the work we do on Muret, we do consulting. So I, I lead sales and marketing for another small ball venture-backed company. I work there 20 hours a week. I also work with a couple other surgeons doing consulting for their early stage ideas. Um, you know, it's a, it's a 60, 70 hour base, but that's sort of the entrepreneurial uh, aspect of life. On the product, uh, we were able to spend more of our non-dilutive funding on product development because that's what they like to see it spent on. So the bias is such that the angel money we raised is more heavily biased towards the IP. The non-dilutive funding is more biased towards the product. The benefit there is that the angels can uh, very s clearly see their money going to work on something that's tangible, that effectively they, they own and can sell down the road. Um, and I think, you know, to, to give a sense of the scales, those percentages are really a, a percentage of the overall um, either, either angel or non-dilutive funding that, that went into the project. Um, to date, we uh, raised a finite amount of money with the angels to do specific things. 
that was demonstrate that the product works well. So we developed a second generation of our tools. We did a series of animal studies with strategics. And we've now um, got multiple strategics in process evaluating the technology. The, the hypothesis is that we uh, understand the optional value of that information that they would come back to us with. And at that point in time, we will either raise more money to go further um, through the FDA or we'll uh, venture into some sort of partnership with a, with a strategic. Great. That's where we're at. So one of the things I think with um, your approach um, here with Moret, how many people in the audience need to or have licensed um, their IP from a university as part of, into their company? So Avi, you're maybe a year uh, mm -hmm. beyond when you executed that agreement right. with uh, for your IP with Stanford. Yep. You know, it, sort of a year into this process, what are um, what are some of your reflections about how you know some of the specific terms of the license yeah. sort of are are impacting things going forward? Um, are you sort of ha generally happy with where things are and don't see any issues where you're going to need to come back to the table to? You know, maybe do an amendment or something, or, or are you sort of t eyeballing that as part of your strategy uh, down the road potentially? We're, we've already done two amendments. Okay. So, so yeah, um, it's, it's really, it's, it was hard. I mean, uh, I'm no expert in IP licensing. Um, it, it took us uh, about a year and a half to, to fully negotiate the license and actually get it signed. And there was, we did our best to try to understand all the business permutations that might um, exist for the intellectual property and try to create contingency plans and different scaled royalties and different scaled payments, but there was still actually more that we wanted to do as we've learned more about the value of what we're doing. And what we've been able to do is really amend within the basic structure, so it's, it's actually adding more granularity. I think that's been an easier sell than trying to say, well, we were going to pay you $100,000, now we're going to pay you $10,000. It's more, it's more like in this scenario, if this happens, we need to provide more structure. Um, so. So it, it did take a long time, and it, it, I think the I think it's the the other tricky part is raising. We were we were able to raise angel money before we had the license in force or really negotiated. Um, the benefit that Stanford does is they make a pick about who they're going to work with long before they actually get the license uh, issued. So that it allows you to have some credibility, but uh, there is a, some sales art to making an, an angel investor comfortable with the fact that this is still a future uh, future scenario. So Mike, as a, as a venture investor, you're dealing with a team that has something you're really interested in. It's coming out of university. Um, they've filed their patents, and you're reassured the patent might be reasonable. But, but in terms of the licensing process, um, given that these don't happen overnight, these license agreements, um, you know, do you, where, where's your sort of areas of concern in the process, and where do you start to get a little bit more comfortable and are okay? You know, the reality is there's nothing about IP that happens overnight. Um, it, it's very unusual, for example, to look at an early stage opportunity that actually has issued IP, you know, patents that have actually been issued. What you're looking at is filings, right? And you're comparing filings to what is known of what other people have done. You know, some prior art you know, some prior art is happening in the same time horizon that you're working, so there's a bit of informed judgment that goes along with that. Um, I'm sure that never came up in the context of Maya, right? Um, and, and so licensing is just sort of one more component of the IP. It's not a positive, it's not a negative, uh, but it is an indicator of, of how um, thoughtful the team is. So if, if you, for example, are, are licensing something from a university and are trying to do that on your own without the advice of good patent counsel who has been through not just IP issues in the past, but has been through IP outlicensing out negotiations with the university and ideally with the university that you're outlicensing from, you know, that, that is a very high sign of credibility that you're taking it seriously, you're getting the right people around you to help you out. Um, and so it's, it's an indicator of the team more than anything else. Okay, great. Um, Amr, can, we, can you tell us a little bit about your journey here with Maya Medical? So um, we, um, we, had, we had our angel investors in the first company. And basically had, they had all invested. They were all convinced of the first opportunity, the AFib. They're all physicians, pretty, uh, uh, physicians or industry. There's no VCs, uh, true angels. B 
people who knew what they were investing in. And when we decided to shift, they also recognized the opportunity. Some of them were hard to track down, and we really wanted all of those guys to reinvest in a new company because we didn't want to inherit any liability. This was really important for us, even if they invested a tiny bit more. And we made it very uh, compelling for them to do so. So we gave them, so we, what we've done uh, for the first company for Apama was convertible loans. You, you put money in the company, ultimately we convert it to Series A, you get some advantage. Uh, so the early investors get, get uh, you know, the 25% warrant, whatever it is. Uh, the, at Series A, there's new investors that come in and, and they just get money for, uh, seri you know, they get shares for the seri in the Series A. Um, so it was hard for us to, it, it was very important for us to get those guys all in and eventually we got them all in and we got new investors. Uh, and we got it uh, through a convertible note at the beginning and then turned it into Series A within a short period of time. Um, so that first sort of bump that you see uh, was the first close, probably like the March of 2011. That was the close, uh, the first close of Series A. So we, we probably took a little bit more money in April and a little bit more in May to complete our Series A. Uh, we had done our first animals. It certainly looked reasonable. Uh, our, our chronic animals were essentially cooking along. Um, and we were continuing to go in, around the same track. We, we, we were, in some ways we wanted money from VCs, in some ways we didn't. I mean, we were pretty, it was pretty obvious that getting VC money is not easy. The thing that we were doing was strictly, a, at the, at the, certainly at the time, it was strictly an OUS play. The IP that Ardian had in the US was very strong and we were uh, thinking this was gonna be very difficult for us. We kept developed, give, developing our technology, which is an RF-based balloon, as we said, um, and we developed a second strategy to really address the U.S. market simultaneously. Um, at one point, it was outside the company as part of the incubator. Eventually, we pulled it in. Um, and we did go to talk to some VCs, uh, but we were hoping that we could actually get our an exit without really getting a lot of money, because once you get money from VCs, you raise so much money the, the return multiples required to satisfy your new investors and board members and so forth would be very difficult. It's hard to sell a company, um, you know, if a VC just invested some money and, you know, only is going to get two or three X, well, that's not that interesting. It's going to, no, you know, you got to keep it going for a few more years and get me my, you know, four X, 10 X or whatever it is they're trying to do. So it was sort of one of those things. We, we sort of talked to them a little bit of flirting with the VCs, but at the end really didn't go anywhere. They were not that interested. Of course, often VCs, at least in our experience, they, they, they take a long time to catch on to something new. It, all of a sudden they all catch up, but only a few really catch up early on. They're, you know, I, I really think of them as, as uh, there's a group think that happens. Um, lemmings. Is lemmings the word you're looking for? I was going to say that. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, convincing them that somebody can actually you know, start a company and sell a company based just strictly on European uh, sales revenue was, was not easy. But we were convinced of it and, and we convinced others. And the key people that we convinced, very similar to what you guys did, um, in that we, we went after people who recently had money, um, who had recently sold companies that we knew. It was essentially the personal network, not in some other industry, not in orthopedics. We went our, uh, after people who, who are very familiar with the sort of thing we're doing, who are selling to the same customers. We went to physicians, even distributors. OUS distributors came to us, sort of a group of them essentially invested. Not a ton of money, but it just created a certain momentum that really helped us out. Um, it was all personal relationships. Some people I never knew, but I knew somebody that knew them personally. It was, it was all... And the pitch, you know, I don't have the pitch slide here, but it was not that many slides. It was just a handful of slides with very little detail. Here's what we're doing, because we were lucky enough to be in a space that was very sexy. I mean, that's just clearly what won the day. And we were moving fast, and that we had a track record of doing that. That was also the key thing. So we were leveraging our prior relationships, our reputation, and so forth. And we did do other things, like consulting and so forth, uh, during the period. We were also doing other companies. So. Uh, and we were very frugal. We didn't spend much money. Before we got started with, with Maya, for a year, we had three people basically with no salary. So, but this was very important. 
to me, what's really important is to allow the company, the technology, the idea to mature. And it, it takes time. It takes a, lot time, a long time. And you don't really don't want money from anybody if you can afford it. Uh, because when you get money early on, everything changes. The pressure is on. You have to perform. And sometimes you're really not ready. You, you have to let it um, mature, ferment. You really don't want to accelerate it in these early stages. Because you may change directions, 100, you know, you may 180 degrees or whatever it is. Um, so it, it needs to be, you know, it needs to, to gather the proper elements, you know, the proper foundation, so you can take it to the next level. Uh, we were lucky to be enough to, to, to be able to do that. We were able to do it fast, and then as soon as we sort of proved some important things, we really needed to get a lot of money because we were in a. Ra this was now so many competitors, and we had to really stay ahead of them. So up to that point where you sort of get everything going, now it's a race. Um, but by then, we felt reasonably comfortable that we can actually get it to the end point, perhaps without raising a Series B. And we got a convertible note. We convinced others to give us money um, by just getting a 3x. There was a limit to how much they can get if they were to get sold. And the pitch was, look, this thing is going to get sold. You can make 3x very likely. Um, and towards the end, we were running out of money. We were in the negotiation process. We raised an additional million, so we're not hostage during that negotiation process. It was only one and a half X. So less than half the money was in Series A. The rest was in, in notes that really was a very limited sort of um, um, upside. Uh, but of course, if we hadn't, they would have converted to Series B. But we never did end up going to Series B. We were lucky enough to, to be able to sell the company then. Uh, but it was purely, like I said, I think to me it was you know, finding people who know your business, develop the relationship with them, and really engage with them, um, and especially if they just recently made money. Their people are very generous during those, that, during that very sensitive period. Um, and if you can catch them just at then, it makes a big difference. Yeah. And then, it, you know, there's a certain momentum that, that gathers, and, and you can leverage that. So I'm going to just follow on that. Amr, you know, you have this... Um, sort of cadre of investors and, and advisors and so forth that you've cultivated and you have these really critical relationships that you've developed. Can you, just looking at, you know, basically 2011 from the chronic animal study to your first in man and CE mark, um, talk about, you know, relative to all the other things you're doing, you're in a sprint, right? Um, how much of your time was dedicated to just managing investor and your SAB yeah. uh, and key communications. Oh, we, we were lucky enough. We had we had a, a board that was made up of myself and my two other investors and close friends and you know Fred Kostravi, him and I have been working for a very long time, and Modesam Sirhan, uh, both seasoned veterans in our industry, and we actually we had only one board meeting. We just didn't have board meetings. It was we didn't have time for silliness like that. You know we just. We, we talked on the phone, we got together, um, and you know, it was all about business and getting things done and how to, to do the next thing. I spent a lot of time dealing with money. It's a pain. It's a major pain, but there's nothing, you know, you have to do it. There's no escape. And I never stopped raising money. I never stopped trying to call, con you know, convince somebody or something like that. Uh, it's an ongoing process while we're, of course, running the business, doing things. Uh, lucky enough to have two, you know, so other key engineers who are very good, pro you know, three other people or whatever, who are extremely good at doing what they're doing. But of course, we had to work together, and and we did. Uh, and it's all in the house. You know, my wife is was very patient up to a point. Um, so we never had enough money either. We never had any more than six months worth of runway. Most of the time, less. Um, at one point, we had to dig into the 401k sort of a thing. So. But then we got lucky. I, we, one of my companies got sold, so I was able to put some money in the company. And that made a big difference, because I'm now putting my own money, and it, it really helps galvanize the other investors to step up. If you're putting this much of your own money into this thing, we know it's good. We, we're going to trust you, and that sort of a thing. So um, it's about convincing others. It's about the relationships. And it's... It's a painful, ongoing process. In some ways, it's still easier than the VCs. I mean, 
when you have so many smaller investors, it can be painful. And it, it has to be managed. Um, but the VC process is also painful, and arguably much more painful and much more costly. So not that we, I wouldn't do a VC deal, or I'm, I don't think that, you know, but if you can get away without it, certainly that's preferable, and especially early on. Because it gives you, there's certain breathing room that exists at that point in time to allow you to get it to the next level. Great, thank you. So in the interest of time, I'm going to, does anybody have any questions? Do you have any questions? Do you have time for a question? We nailed it, obviously. We did, obviously. So I'm just going to um, wrap up with some quick highlights. Um, one of the things that we've heard about um, and I'll, uh, mentioned also in, in Alan's talk are, uh, but certainly exemplified by um, Sam and Akshay and Anavi with some of the programs they've been involved with, is that early on they had investors in, in themselves their, as individuals, as entrepreneurs. Um, and that I think played a role in some fashion. Um, I think all, the other thing we've heard uh, through all of these stories, because there are early investors, you know, it's really critical. It's not just the money. I mean, that was, that's been pivotal in each of these stories. It's really the people behind the money and what the, the value that those individuals are bringing. Um, I think we've also seen some really interesting creative and, and, fl uh, and flexible models um, which are really suited toward what's going on today. I mean, I think that as, and we, as we were preparing for this panel and these discussions, there was a consistent theme. These, got, these, these guys needed to adapt to a, a really profound change in the environment, and I think they've, they've done that remarkably. Um, going so far as to, you know, recognize that this path was going to be longer, so, you know, managing, uh, consulting, and other activities uh, to fund themselves and fund, you know, ramen and rent, um, uh, leveraging non-dilutive funding such as SBIRs, um, and certainly identifying new sources of funding, and, and there are many things coming on, on the, the front. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is just to truly appreciate the realities of, of this new landscape and to make sure you're informed. Um, the, the, some of the signals that um, investors and others in the, in the device community look at are, and are paying very close attention to are um, what the CDRH uh, is approving, uh, any big policy changes, just that approval activity starts to signal some good things. Um, obviously, we, we talked a little bit about the M&A activity. Um, and with that, I think we're going to wrap up. I mean, we have um, you know, shown that uh, despite challenges, um, you, know, you can uh, the, the power of data and results to really get your clinical folks invo involved, um, how to manage uh, doctors as investors, um, using the concept of exclusivity in, in, get in uh, motivating people to get into your deal. Um, I think uh, Amr's, um, you know, I think I, I just imagine this, you know, big, big red circle with a slash for no board meetings, you know, just a more <laughs> efficient way, uh, just because no one had time. Um, so with that, I think we're going to please help me to um, thank this panel for their time today.